All right, folks, today we're going to talk about price discrimination. It's chapter 14 of your book and the chapter on monopoly, and the pages are listed there uh, on the screen. Now, a lot of us have been uh, raised to believe that discrimination is wrong and that it's a, a bad thing to do, and generally speaking, that's the case. But with price discrimination, it's a little different. Um, so let me give you some examples of, some, of price discrimination. Uh, who pays more, your grandparents or you at Denny's? Typically, it's your grandparents. They get some sort of senior citizen discount. Who pays more at the movies, adults or children? Typically, children pay, uh, will pay less than adults because kids usually get either a reduced fee or there's a student price that's less than the normal price. Um, who has to pay more for auto insurance? Is it boys or girls? Typically, it's boys because historically, they have a higher rate of accidents. Um, and typically, and when it comes to airlines, the person who bought the plane ticket today pays more than the person who bought it two weeks ago. So anytime that a business decides to charge one group a different price than another group for the same product, we have what's called price discrimination. It can only occur in any sort of uh, market structure where you have control over price. So basically it can occur in any market structure except for perfect competition because in perfect competition every firm is a price taker. So why would a firm want to be uh, involved in price discrimination. Well, let's take a look at an example and then we can see. Let's pretend for a minute that Denny's is a, uh, a monopoly, that there's only one breakfast place in the town that we're living in. And, uh, and we'll also assume that Denny's marginal cost per meal is $2 per meal and that there are 100 senior citizens who are willing to pay $4 and 100 college students who are willing to pay $8 for their Grand Slam breakfast. So the, the question then that um, that Denny's faces is what price should they charge? And uh, there, are, there are a couple of different ways they could approach this. They could be a single price monopolist, in which case they could choose to charge $4, say, for four meals. And if they do that, then they'll end up with a profit of uh, $400 because we've got uh, 200 people buying meals at $4 a piece. That's $800 in revenue. Every uh, meal has a marginal cost of $2. So um, so they got $400 worth of, of costs, and so um, we see a profit of $400. So maybe they want to say, okay, fine, $4 price not enough. Let's try $8. In which case, they'll be selling to 100 students because they'll have priced the senior citizens out of the market, and they'll end up with a profit of uh, $600. There'll be $800 in revenue because $8 per meal times 100 students is $800 in revenue. They'll sell 100 meals at a marginal cost of $2 per meal, so there's $200 there, so they'll have $600 uh, in profit. But is that the best that they can do? What if instead of charging a single price, they were a price discriminator and they charged a price of $4 for some and $8 for others? If they were to go ahead and price discriminate, then they would have 100 seniors buying meals at $4 a piece, uh, leaving them with a profit of $200 from senior citizen meals. They could have 100 students buying meals at $8 a piece, and they'd have $600 in profit from that. And if you add the two profits together, they have $800, which is better than charging any single one uh, price. So in this case, price discrimination is very helpful for Denny's because they can increase their profits. We could look at the situation graphically, and we could say that um, we have consumer surplus to begin with. But if they were to charge two different prices, we would have one group paying the higher price, and this would be their profit for Denny's, for the higher priced group. There would be a group paying a slightly lower price, and that would be profit for them as well. And so we'd begin eating away at uh, consumer surplus as the company picks up more and more profit. And in fact, if they wanted to charge a three-tier price, then they would increase their profits even more um, by being more price discriminatory. So how is it even possible for a monopolist to be able to charge a different price for different groups? Well, it boils down to a couple of things. One is that people's price points are either more or less elastic. The less elastic people's demand is, the more uh, able a monopolist is to charge a higher price for them. And then, obviously, the more elastic your demand, they'll lower their price. So what they're trying to do is basically find that price point for each group and then charge the maximum price that that group is willing to pay. So. Again, an example would be senior citizens at Denny's. They want to eat, but they don't want to spend a whole lot. They're very elastic with their demand, and so they command a lower price 
than college students or families with, with small kids. Uh, parents with, with little kids uh, are going to be a little um, more elastic too, I suppose, in the sense that they have a, a budget of some sort. But um, you know, the willingness to pay will dictate whether or not a, uh, a monopolist can charge a, a different price for a different group or not. The ultimate goal in, uh, for a monopolist when it comes to price discrimination is to, to be having what they call perfect price discrimination. If they were somehow able to charge um, a different price for every single consumer along their demand curve, they then we would have perfect price discrimination. And in essence, what they would do is take away all of the consumer surplus and claim it to themselves in the form of profit. And so that's kind of where monopolists would like to be with price discrimination. How do they get there? Well, they try in a number of different ways. Um, one way is through advanced purchase requirements. And basically, um, you are more price elastic the further out um, you are from an event. So if you need to buy airfare, for example, to take a trip, you're very price sensitive six months out. But if you have to buy a ticket for a flight tomorrow, you're much less price elastic, you're more price inelastic because you got to go. And so um, some sort of purchase requirement that, that gives a discount to people who buy early and then raises the price for those who buy later is a way for monopolists and other um, firms and other market structures to price discriminate and try to maximize the profit that they get. Volume discounts is another. Um, convincing people to uh, purchase more if they're more price sensitive and they're worried about unit costs, they'll buy more things. Um, and if you're not price sensitive, you're just going to go ahead and buy it at the regular price and that's also fine with the monopolist because they're going to be able to maximize their profit. Or there's another thing called a two-part tariff. You often see that at like Costco or Sam's Club, where you have to pay an entry fee to be able to shop at the store uh, through a membership of some sort. And then, um, then you purchase your goods. And in essence, what that does is it makes the purchase price of the first good you buy extraordinarily high, much higher than uh, you might have been willing to pay otherwise. And so that helps the, uh, the price discriminating company um, to capture more of your consumer surplus and increase their profit. And then as you buy more things, it becomes relatively less expensive because you're spreading the cost of the membership across a number, a number of different goods and it sort of acts as a volume discount. But the goal is, in all of these cases, to try and get people to pay the maximum price they're willing to pay for any particular good. And the more able they are to get individuals to pay that maximum price, the more they can make those groups smaller and smaller and smaller until they're individualized, the more they can capture your surplus and increase their profit. Probably the ultimate example of this in the real world is uh, used car salesmen, where they will talk and, and negotiate with you until they get you down to that price that you're willing to pay. And every person pays a little different price for every car that they buy. And, um, and that's the, exactly the kind of example of price discrimination you would expect out of a monopolist or uh, virtually any other firm in any other market structure except for perfect competition. We'll go ahead and take some more uh, practice with this, look at some problems in class, and I'll see you when you get here.